Oh, I forgot to mention something very important. Today happens to be JT's 18th birthday. So uh, we're celebrating that today. He's all grown up. So we, uh, we're happy for that. Uh, he's been a, a wonderful blessing to our home and we can't be more proud of him. So happy birthday, JT. Amen. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be picking up in our study in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And uh, we, in chapter 8, we looked at some things in connection to faith. And we're going to kind of continue that theme. In chapter 8, we saw that faith, or true faith, is faith that remembers, faith that understands, and then faith that acts. And we found all three of those elements in chapter 8. And Jesus is really honing in on his disciples. Uh, they've already learned a lot of practical things about going out and proclaiming the, the kingdom. Uh, but now Jesus is zeroing in on faith. And one of the main driving forces that would help them as they worked out this practical, uh, logistical way of going about and preaching the kingdom was faith. And we're going to find that theme, as I mentioned before, continue through chapter 10. And we're going to, I'm sorry, through chapter 9. Um, in chapter 9, we have the transfiguration uh, at the beginning of it. And uh, we'll see some, some ways in which their faith really comes to, to blossom, but also is also challenged as we move forward. But it says in chapter 9, in verse 1, And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, here he's speaking to his disciples. And before we go into what you know he, he meant exactly here, I, I'd like to take note of something that maybe could be overlooked. And that is the fact that the disciples are still with Jesus. Uh, in chapter 8, uh, they would have had one of the greatest challenges to their faith. After Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and that wonderful pronouncement of faith and who Jesus Christ was, immediately they were challenged. Well, you believe that I am the Christ, but this is what it means. I'm going to have to suffer and I'm going to have to die, but I'll, be, but I'll raise again on the third day. And Peter's like, no, that can't be the way it goes. <laughs> uh, you're the Christ. You don't suffer. You don't die. Uh, and even further than that, the challenge would be, hey, not only am I going to die, but if you have faith in me and you come after me, you're going to have to die too, in a sense. Uh, really great challenges to faith for these disciples, I'm sure, and for us as well as we read, read these words. But you know what? They're still with Jesus. And no matter what you can say about the disciples, and we've seen... In chapter 8, them, you know, kind of confused, worrying about bread when Jesus is talking about things much deeper and forgetting the fact that Jesus isn't concerned about bread and, and then being challenged with who Christ, what it meant that Christ was the Messiah. Uh, we'll find some other challenges even as we move through chapter 9. Despite all their, uh, I guess, uh, faults in connection to their faith, their, the times that they waver in faith, you know what? They were always with Jesus. And they always stayed connected to Jesus. Even in John chapter 6, when Jesus told, told the crowds, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, you will not uh, see life. And everyone got, uh, you know, kind of thrown off track by those statements. And everyone else left. But you know what? The disciples were still there. And Jesus is like, aren't you going to go with them? And they're like, no, Lord. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I'm sure they were just as confused with what Jesus said as the rest of the crowd, but they always stuck with Jesus. And as a matter of fact, that will remain true, even as he travels on down to, the, to Jerusalem. And until the Garden of Gethsemane, then they will flee from him. But not permanently. They will come back to him and uh, remain faithful to him. So, I guess what we learn from this is that we're going to falter sometimes too. Sometimes our faith is going to waver. Sometimes we're going to get off track. Sometimes we're going to misunderstand. We're going to fumble and we're going to, you know, stumble through this walk that we have before us. But you know what? What he's really looking for is not perfect faith or anything like that. What he's looking for is commitment. Are you committed to me? Will you stick with me even in the hard times? Even when you don't understand, even when your faith is wavering, will you be like these disciples who 
cling to me, walk with me, walk the dusty roads, walk in the rain, the difficulties, the trials, everything that happens, will you stick with me? Will you be committed to me? That's what Jesus is looking for, commitment. He knows we're, he knows we're frail. He knows that we, we are imperfect beings, but he's looking for a heart that's committed to him, and that's a big part of faith, holding on to Christ no matter what. Um, the disciples are still with Jesus. I think that's uh, amazing and worth noting. But anyways, it says that he, he was talking to him. And he says, you know, truly, you know, there's some standing here today who will not see death until they see the power, the kingdom of God coming in power. And some commentaries would tie that to what's about to occur, the transfiguration, um, which very well was a manifestation of who Christ was in the kingdom. Uh, and it ties together the kingdom of Israel with Moses and Elijah, and then with Jesus in this uh, kingdom of heaven that was coming, this new thing that was about to take place. Uh, and so there is a sense in which the transfiguration was a manifestation of the kingdom of God in power. But we also know that it would be true at the day of Pentecost when they were in the upper room and they were all praying and, and the, the Holy Spirit came like tongues of fire on them and they heard a mighty rushing wind and then they began to speak in tongues. And that was really when the power of heaven came to be with man. Christ had ascended to the right hand of the Father and he poured out his spirit. And, and uh, Peter quotes Joel chapter 2, says, hey, this is the fulfillment. That, that in the end times, this, uh, the spirit would be poured on all flesh. They'd prophesy. They'd, the old man would dream dreams. Uh, this is all fulfillment of scriptures. And so even in that more real sense, there was some that were there with him who would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God coming with power. And that was absolutely true. It was going to happen uh, within the year. So, now they're going to get a glimpse of it. It says in verse 2, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a mountain by themselves. Now, those of you who are familiar with all the different... Uh, uh, Gospels that talk about this, you'll know that in Luke 9, it says eight days after this, um, he was transfigured. Eight days was a way in which they would say a week. So it was approximately a week, eight days. Or you could also say, well, it was six full days, but if you count the partial days on either side of those six days, it, it, you could say eight days. So it's not really an inconsistency. It's just a different way of rendering the time. But anyway, six days later, he took Peter and James and John. Now, these were the three guys that were with him on special occasions. You remember when he rose uh, Jairus' daughter up from the dead? He only took these three guys with him. We also see that when he goes into the garden, when he goes deeper into the garden, he takes these three guys with him. Uh, these were his inner circle. These are the guys that he was really going to work with. Uh, they were the pillars of the church, and he was going to uh, make sure that they saw these things and had these things to... Uh, think back on as they would meet challenges uh, in, in faithfully following him. Anyways, he says he took him up on a high mountain by themselves. Now, traditionally, this is Mount Tabor. Uh, but that may not likely, that may not be necessarily the case. Uh, Mount Tabor was really far away from Caesarea Philippi, which is this area that's being discussed. Um, and so it, it would have been not really in the right area. Uh, also, it was only a, a little above a thousand feet off, you know, in elevation. Most likely it's Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon uh, would have been closer to the area where all this is taking place. And also it, it rose up to 9,000 feet uh, in elevation. So it would have been, as it says here, a high mountain. And so doesn't really matter. I mean, the story remains the same, but those are some of the, the, the things that are uh, spoken about. These are the two mountains that are usually tied to this Mount of Transfiguration. But there they are. Um, Jesus is now having solitude with his disciples, and this will become a theme as we continue on through the story. More and more, Jesus is going to be seeking one-on-one -on -one instruction with his disciples. Uh, up to this point, we've seen humongous crowds pressing in against him, uh, him having to go out in a boat just to speak to them all. Uh, just a very uh, public way of speaking and ministering to the people. But now he's kind of, again, zeroing in on his disciples. And here he's taking these three guys up on top of a mountain 
uh, to be alone with them, but also to show them something spectacular. As we continue in verse 3, it says, And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. So, it says that he was transfigured before him. Luke says that his face changed. And then Matthew talks about uh, his face actually shining. So that was the way that his face changed. It just began to shine very brightly. And so Jesus, right before them as they're on the mountain, can you imagine being the disciples up there with Jesus? And he just, <clears throat> just changes automatically. Um, becomes bright. And this, I believe, can be a lesson for us. I know there's more going on in this story than this, but this oftentimes happens practically in our lives. When we accept Christ as who he is, and when we walk committed to him, no matter what that means for us, Jesus becomes transfigured <coughs> before us. That is, Jesus is no longer just some man that lived 2,000 years ago. He's not just some nice person that was nice to people and, and gave some good teachings. Um, he's not just a good teacher, but he's the son of God. And he becomes our savior. He's the one that we latch on to, we, we commit ourselves to, we abide in, we commune with. He becomes our life. He becomes our passion. He becomes everything that we're about. When we accept him in that way and we take the full package, he becomes transfigured. He's no longer just Jesus of Nazareth, who was a man who lived, but he becomes the Son of God, and his face shines, and we see him in all of his glory as he walks with us, as he lives with us, as he comforts us, and he strengthens us, and he empowers us, and he equips us, and he does all these things in our lives. We find a Christ who is shining, who's beaming before us, showing us the great glory of heaven. That's the wonderful thing about Christ. When we take him by faith, we see him as he truly is. Not just a man, the Son of God. Not just a person who lived for a short time, but the living God, the one exalted to the right hand of the Father, our high priest, the one that we serve, the one that we love, the one that we are committed to. He becomes transfigured for us. That's what faith can do for us. Here he's being transfigured before them. And it says that even his garments became radiant. Anything even touching him, touching his body, became radiant as well. Uh, his garments became white. And then he says, verse 4, Elijah appeared to him along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Boy, what a conversation. Talk about wanting to be a fly on the wall in that conversation. Uh, Luke tells us that what they were kind of discussing was um, his coming departure. Literally, his exodus, which is interesting because he's talking to Moses, who also had a great exodus. Uh, of course, in a different way, this exodus was out of Egypt. Jesus' exodus would be out of this world going to the right hand of his father. But that's what they're discussing. Jesus is about to die. They're, 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 they're talking it over. I wish we knew more details about what exactly and precisely they were talking about. But that's what they're doing. And Moses is seen as the great deliverer, but also the one tied to the law, right? The law of God. He was the one who, cried, who God uh, spoke to directly in the tent of meeting, but also on Mount Sinai. He gave him the Ten Commandments. Twice he gave him the Ten Commandments because the first set got broken uh, or was broken. But um, he was tied to the law and the great deliverer in that sense. And Jesus Christ himself too would be the great deliverer. Elijah is tied to the prophets. Uh, as we mentioned when we were in our study in Matthew, uh, Elijah is tied to the prophets. If you, when In a Jewish mind, if you wanted to just sum up the prophets, you'd say Elijah. He was the prominent uh, prophet and in their day and age. But what's interesting is both Moses and Elijah were followed by somebody. In other words, their ministry continued through somebody else. Moses' ministry fell to who? Remember, Moses wasn't allowed to enter into the land. Uh, he was able to see the land up, up there on Mount Pisgah. He's looking out, he could see the land, but God said, No, you can't go into the land. And he died. And no one knows where his body is, which is interesting. Uh, when you also think about Elijah, who was followed by somebody else, uh, by Elisha. Elijah, ministry went so far, but then he gave his, his cloak, if you will, to Elisha. And Elisha would take on the ministry, but Elijah too was taken up. Where's his body? No one knows. 
yeah, it's just gone. Uh, and so you have both this continuation of ministry through uh, Joshua and then also through Elisha. And it's interesting that Jesus is uh, really the fulfillment of what they um, were uh, typologically looking forward to Christ. Uh, Joshua was the one who entered into the land. Joshua's name literally in Hebrew is Yeshua, which Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua. The two are tied together. As Joshua went conquering the enemies of God and, and making a way for God's people, Jesus did the same as well, going in, being the one who would bring about our salvation, the means for us to enter into our inheritance, the new heavens and the new earth. It will be all through Jesus Christ. But Elisha, too, is tied to Christ. If you go in and you do a study on Elisha, pay real close attention to the miracles that Elisha does. Almost, if not every, miracle that Elisha does, Jesus does too, tying himself to Elisha. And so um, I find that very fascinating, the fact that these are two guys that were followed up by someone else, and then it was fulfilled. With Jesus Christ, the same was true. You had John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah and came and taught a baptism of repentance, brought the people into repentance, very similar to what Elijah did. Uh, with the priests of Baal and things like that. But then Christ came in and stepped on the scene and finished it out and, and really fulfilled what John the Baptist was preparing the way for. Um, so it's very appropriate that it's these two guys who are on this mountain talking to Jesus. All these guys had something uh, in common. Jesus himself, just as Moses and Elijah, uh, Moses' body not found, who knows, maybe it was taken up. Uh, Elijah also taken up, Christ too would be ascended into heaven. So there's just so many different uh, connections between uh, these people, but nonetheless, they're talking together. And what a meeting it was. And Peter recognizes something great is happening. We're witnessing something wonderful. Uh, so much so that he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> and uh, it says uh, in verse 5, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, uh, for they became terrified. So Peter, I guess, felt like even if he didn't know what to say, he had to say something. And Peter was always the one, usually the more vocal apostle and uh, was usually the one who would speak up. And here he's saying, let us make three tabernacles. In other words, three booths or three temporary dwellings, uh, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh, in other words, well, there's several things that could be going on here as he makes this suggestion. And one might be, hey, all right, this is it. This is the kingdom of God. He said that we see the kingdom of God coming in glory. Moses and Elijah is here. Jesus is here. All these are wonderful people. All right, let's set up camp. You know, let them stay here. Uh, we'll all come to this mountain. This will be the mountain that will serve the Lord with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus uh, giving us instructions. All right, this is, we, we reached the end. That could be what he's talking about. Um, it might be the fact that he's just, this is just a way of him showing them honor. Uh, you know, let's make a tabernacle for these people. You know, the tabernacle in the wilderness for God uh, was a place to meet with God and to honor God. Maybe that's what he's talking about. But in either case, no matter what, uh, what interpretation you take, in essence, what Peter is doing here is putting Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the, on the same playing field. He's basically making them equal to one another. And that was not uh, correct. That was a misunderstanding. So in verse 7, it says, Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Okay, um, I believe it's the Matthew account says that the cloud was actually shiny. It was a, it was a bright cloud. Uh, but nonetheless, it's the voice that's more important. The voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my son, listen to him. Again, we get an indication or a, uh, a remembrance of the Exodus. How did, Jesus, how did God guide the people through the wilderness? It was through the cloud. Right? Whenever the cloud was on the, the tabernacle, the people would stay camped. Whenever it would rise, it's like, okay, it's time to go. And then they would leave. That was the way that God guided him. Now the Lord is taking a cloud and saying, 
Jesus is the direction. Jesus is the one to listen to. He's the one you'll, you'll get instructions from. He's the one that will tell you when to go, when to stay. And at the same time, he's lifting Jesus up above Moses and Elijah. As wonderful as the law and the prophets were in the Old Testament, Christ came as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And now he's the one you should listen to. Go to the book of Hebrews. Remember, we, we did that study a couple of years ago. And really that whole first section of the book of Hebrews is all about, yeah, in and, and, and past times and many different ways the, the Lord spoke through the prophets and this, that, and the other. But in these last days, he spoke to us through his son. So he's the one that we should listen to. He's the one we should cling to. And so now Jesus is getting an exalted position over the law, even the law and the prophets. In verse 8, all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. So once Jesus gets his exalted verification and, and, and God confirms him as the one to listen to, Moses and Elijah go away. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? As you go into the New Testament, one of the greatest battles Paul taught was, hey, now that Christ has come, the law and the prophets have been fulfilled. Stop trying to be circumcised. These new moons and Sabbaths, those are all a shadow. But now the substance has come, Christ. And now the law and the prophets being removed, we have Christ as a fulfillment of both. So when we follow Christ, when we live for Christ, when we're connected to Christ, identified with Christ, we are through Christ also fulfilling the law and the prophets. We, we, we find it in its full fulfillment and we receive him in that way. But it's also true that even in, in a personal sense, and I, I believe I brought this up in Matthew 17 when we were in there, but I think it's worth mentioning again. And even in our lives, when we exalt Christ in the proper way, when we don't see Jesus and my job and my family, as wonderful as those things are, but we were just putting Jesus on an equal footing with everything else, my hobbies, entertainment. When we say no, listen to Christ, put Christ where he's supposed to be. Exalt him. He put him back on the throne of your heart. Put him in the proper position. And when we're focused on him and our eyes are fixed on him and his, and, and his wonderful authority over our lives, pretty soon when we're walking in this life and when we're living in this world, we'll see nothing but Jesus. And that's the point we want to get to. I want to get to the point where I'm living and I see nothing but Jesus because my eyes are fixed <coughs> on Jesus. Not that I'm not aware that other things are going on, but just the fact that in everything we do, we see Jesus. If I'm ministering to my family, I'm ministering because I see Jesus in their faces. If I'm working for my job or for my boss at work, as Colossians brings out, and, and uh, we're not working for our boss, for our master, but we're working and laboring for him as though we're working for Christ. Everything is about Christ. My career, my job, if I am involved in some hobby whatever it is it's all under the awareness that christ is with me and that he is the one that my life is truly about uh it should get to the point in our lives where everything is christ we see nothing but christ christ before me christ behind me christ above me christ below me uh, as uh as you probably heard before but anyways it says in verse 9 eventually you gotta come down from the mountain right so um, as wonderful as it is having a, a long time with the Lord, uh, as wonderful as it is seeing him in his glory and all of those things, eventually they had to come down from the mountain. It's time to go back and um, go, kind of continue this ministry again. And uh, that's important for us to understand. We need to come down from the mountain sometimes. Um, not that we ever lose a sense of Christ and his glory and his wonder and his greatness, but just that we also aren't just people who walk around with glazed faces and ignore everyone around us, but that, that we actually get busy of ministering to others. Because we've beheld Christ in his glory and his wonder and his majesty, that propels us then to go down and do something practical about it. Not just to be theological people who sit around reading books all day, but we actually go out and we put, put boots to the ground. Or as David said one time, the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, we just go out there and do what we're, what we're called to do. So they come down from the mountain, verse 9. And he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. 
which gets us another uh, great uh, principle here that this is a wonderful message. We saw Jesus glorified. We saw him transfigured before us. And who among us wouldn't want to go running out and telling everybody what we saw? Um, when we experience Christ in a, in a very special way, of course we want to share that with others. And I'm sure that would have been their temptation. We said, no, 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 no. Now's not the time yet. There's, there will be a time and a place for this to be revealed. There's a timeline. Uh, we got to follow the timeline. And that's important for us to understand. It's not just important to have the right words to speak, to have the right message to give. And it's not just enough to have a desire to want to give the message, but timing is, is of great importance as well. And being tactful in the way that we share the gospel, being timely, giving a timely word when sharing the gospel with people is very, very important. Uh, there are some times perhaps when maybe the time isn't right quite yet. Uh, obviously, if someone just lost a loved one, you're at a funeral, that's not the time to start telling them, hey, you're a sinner, guilty before God, you need to come to repent. You know, we, we need to have tact when we come and, and realize that, yes, we need to have the right words, the right message, but also have the right timing. And, and when we come to the Lord in prayer for the right words, we should also come to the Lord also praying for the right timing. Lord, open the door when the time is right for me to speak to this individual. Uh, when their heart is most in tune to the gospel. We got to remember that God is working in everybody's lives. And the Lord is working in an individual's life. And the time will become appropriate and, and ripe for the harvest in which that person is now prepared to receive the message. And we need to pray to the Lord that our timing will be right just as our words are right. Um, it's a delicate balance, uh, but uh, it's important. And he says, uh, not to relate it until, uh, not to relate what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. And that's the, that's the part that uh, they really seize on verse 10. They seize upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. And that was a challenge for Jews for thousands of years, or especially in the intertestinal period. Uh, between that, the exile and then the coming of Christ, the big discussion was this resurrection. What was the resurrection going to be like? Was it a literal resurrection? Was it a figurative re uh, uh, resurrection? It was, a, it was a hot topic. You had the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. You had the Pharisees that did believe in the resurrection. Paul, one time when he was speaking uh, before the religious leaders, he said, I'm standing here before because of my belief in the resurrection, and immediately the house divided. Um, the Pharisees started saying, oh, we know, well, maybe he did see something from the Lord. And the Sadducees are saying, ah, out with this man. Uh, that was a very heated debate and topic. And now Jesus is mentioning something about the raising from the dead. Wait a minute. Jesus is going to be raised from the dead? We know about the general resurrection talked about in Daniel, but we never really heard or known about this Messiah who would be raised from the dead, separate from the general resurrection. Uh, they would have been challenged by the statement, and they're discussing this among themselves. Uh, so they're getting involved in some theology as they're going down the mountain. Uh, and then in verse 11, they asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So Jesus had told them, You will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God coming with glory. They saw Jesus being transfigured before them, and this was messing with their timeline with their apologize for using a big word but their eschatological timeline in other words uh, eschatology is just the uh, the uh, study of the end times the jewish people had uh, a belief in the end times how things were going to happen the great day of the lord first spoken about by amos he's the first one to use that phrase um, that was going to be a time when god was going to make everything right israel would be glorified again and restored the resurrection the general resurrection would take place but before that happened Quoting from Malachi, Elijah was to come and restore all things. And then the kingdom would come. And so they're kind of confused. Wait, things are happening a bit fast. Uh, are you saying this is going to happen soon? If so, where's Elijah? Why hasn't he come yet? Is, is kind of the, the thing that they're asking. In verse 12, it says, And he said to them, Elijah does come first and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. So 
yeah, Elijah has come. And we find uh, in other places that Jesus ties this Elijah to John the Baptist. Even in Luke chapter 1, before John the Baptist is even born, this prophecy is spoken over him that he would be the one who would come and restore things. He would be the one who would prepare the way for the Lord. Uh, as we saw in chapter 1 of, of Mark, um, he was Elijah in, in position, in title, in the function that he had in the kingdom. And so Elijah had come. And then also, this suffering must take place as well. And then the kingdom will come, is what he's telling them. Oh, by the way, and he says, and Elijah, and the, and in, Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished. This is another way that John the Baptist was tied to Elijah. Uh, if you look at how Elijah suffered and how John the Baptist suffered, it's very similar. So who was it that persecuted Elijah? It was Ahab and Jezebel, right? Mainly being instigated by Jezebel. And uh, they were persecuting, chasing after Elijah uh, to the point that Elijah gets discouraged. You know, I'm the only one who's following the Lord. And he's by that, that uh, little river and the Lord's providing for him. It's because he was being persecuted by Ahab and Jezebel. Well, you look at John the Baptist and you have Herod and Herodias. And who's the one instigating it? Herodias. So Herodias kind of takes the place of Jezebel. Uh, Herod, the place of um, Ahab, and they're being persecuted similarly. So, another tie, interesting tie to Elijah and John the Baptist. But again, Jesus is basically saying, when you see John the Baptist, or when you saw John the Baptist, you were seeing really Elijah who was to come. Then in verse 14, when they came back, when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and some scribes arguing with them. Don't be surprised that when you have your quiet time with the Lord, you're alone with Him, and boy, you've got everything right. You're even uh, wrestling these, these difficult topics, and, and you're really spending time in communion with the Lord, that when you go out the door in the morning, you meet nothing but trouble. And uh, you walk in the door at work, and there's commotion or whatever, things to kind of get you off track. But this is what they find. They come out of this wonderful experience with Christ, this great theological discussion, and boom, trouble. There's this great crowd, and people are arguing and going back and forth, this great discussion. Uh, and it says in verse 15, Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, What are you, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever he, it seizes him, it uh, slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. So he has this son, this demonic, and it's a pretty serious case. Uh, he's, he, you know, he's grinding his teeth, he's straightening out. Uh, there's just, he's uncontrollable. There's nothing they can really do. And so he's bringing this son to the disciples. Interesting thing he says to you, uh, but in bringing him to the disciples, it was as though he was bringing them to Jesus, bringing him to Jesus. But this is a problem, and, and he's a little concerned. Your disciples were not able to do it. Uh, that becomes important in a moment. In verse 19, and he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. So here we go, back to this theme of faith. The disciples are being challenged by faith. Nine of the disciples, nine of the apostles are involved in this, and none of them seem to be able to cast out this demon. And Jesus could be referring directly to them. He could be directing it towards the crowd. He could be directing it towards both. Maybe to this man. We'll see this man was kind of challenged with faith as well. But nonetheless, he comes down off the mountain and sees nothing but unbelief. In verse 20, they brought the boy to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And by the way, you know, here they're bringing him to Jesus, and it seems like it's getting worse. Uh, this, seems, this is like a last-ditch uh, effort by the evil spirit, right? Before he's about to get cast out, he knows who Jesus is, and, he, and he's doing this towards the end. So remember this, when you're bringing someone to the Lord, and you're trying to work with them, and share the gospel with them and bring them before the Lord. Don't be surprised if things don't get worse. That 
greater temptation comes over that person, greater challenges, roadblocks, seemingly roadblocks get brought up and it becomes even worse as you're working with them. Uh, it could be a last ditch effort by the enemy to try to keep that person from accepting the gospel. Um, don't be discouraged by that. We just work through that and uh, continue to try to bring them to the Lord. But in verse 21, and he asked his father, how long has, he, has this been happening to him? That is, Jesus is asking him. And he said, from childhood. So it must have been happening for quite some time. Uh, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And so this child is really the embodiment of someone captured in sin as well. What does sin do? It's destructive. It causes harm to ourselves. It causes harm to everybody else. And it becomes a dire situation. We have to bring people to Christ so that they can experience uh, freedom from this. But here you have a person actually captured in demonic activity. And he says, uh, if you are possible, or if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. That's very interesting. And I think that perhaps what's going on here is that the man had already brought them to the disciples. He would have known there wasn't any secret that Jesus had power over demons. It probably was no secret that Jesus had sent them out. Remember on that limited uh, commission in chapter 6? where he gave them powers over the demons and things that the disciples had the power to release demons. But here he brings them to the disciples, and because of the disciples' lack of belief, they're not able to cast it out. Which shows something important to us. And, oh, and by the way, and because of the disciples' lack of faith and inability to cast out this demon, he begins to doubt Jesus. If you are able, if you can do anything, help us. And I can't help but believe that there's a connection there. I took them to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. And they're your disciples. So I don't know if you can do anything. But if you can, help us. And, you know, as we're living before the Lord. And as we're living in the months of, uh, or in the midst of this world. The people of this world. What our faith and our commitment to the Lord. And our overcoming obstacles and our accomplishing feats for the Lord and things are being seen by the world. And if they look at our lives and see us defeated, if they see us engaged in sin, they see us uh, living really an a unimpressive life, just like a life just like everybody else, and then we want to bring them to Jesus and tell them, oh, if you come to Jesus, he can free you from the bondage of sin and he can make your life wonderful and make you happy. But they look at our lives and we're all grumpy and defeated and, uh, you know, just down and out. You really think that they're going to believe that Jesus can do that for them when they don't even see Jesus doing that for you? Our lack of faith can inhibit a lack of faith in other people around us. And people will say, hey, you know, why would I come to Jesus? I don't see him doing really anything impressive in your life. Uh, we got to be careful about that. Walking by faith will lead other people into faith. Walking in disbelief will lead other people into disbelief. There's a connection between the two. Something we should be uh, cognizant of. But Jesus asked him about it. He says, if you can, <laughs> if you can, why are you saying that? All things are possible to him who believes. So the problem is not with me. The problem is with you. The problem is with you not having the faith, not uh, having the belief. He says in verse 24, immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. And that can be the mantra of our lives, right? Because that's the constant challenge. The tension in our lives as Christians, as we try to walk by faith, is the tension between faith in belief and non-belief. That idea of, Lord, I believe, but at the same time I have doubts. I believe, Lord, I know what you say is true, but when it comes to actually acting on that or receiving that in, uh, practically in my life, ooh, it just becomes a challenge. And, and that should be something, a prayer that we should be making to the Lord as well. Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came and died for sinners. I believe that you, raised, you rose on the third day. I believe that you're exalted at the right hand of the Father. But Lord, help me with my unbelief in this particular situation. Sometimes we want just a problem fix. But maybe we need to take a step back and first wrestle with the unbelief that's 
causing the disconnect between us actually walking into something the Lord could bless us with. Um, this is a good request by this man. I do believe help my unbelief. It's a humble request. He's recognizing his doubt, but at the same time, uh, his faith. In verse 25, when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. So the crowds are coming. Remember, Jesus is wanting alone time with his disciples. He's really wanting to focus on them now, not so much the crowds. And the crowds are building and building and building. I'm sure all this commotion and arguing and everything was causing even more people to try to you know, come see what's right. You ever drive down the road and there's a car wreck? And all of a sudden, congestion. And everybody slows down. Everyone wants to see what's going on. And that might be what was going on here. So Jesus says, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll cast it out. And he casts out the, the, the evil spirit. Um, commands him, actually, to come out. In verse 26, again, things get a little bit worse before they get better. In verse 26, after crying out and throwing him into a terrible convulsions, it came out. Um, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. Interesting. When we become freed from the bondage of sin through the working of Christ in our lives, Immediately, there might be more temptations, more challenges, but then eventually we get to the point in which we become like dead men. That is, we become dead with Christ. In, in baptism, that's what it symbolizes. That's our ultimate goal, right? To be buried with Christ, to die with Him, that our old self was crucified with Him, Romans 6, uh, verse 6, or verse 7. Uh, he frees us from sin, and then we become like dead men. Dead to sin, dead to the world, dead to the flesh, alive to God, to live for Him. Uh, that's our ultimate goal. And when we submit ourselves to death before Him, He brings life into us. In verse 27, But Jesus took Him by the hand and raised Him, and He got up. This man wasn't dead, but it was as though He was dead. When we come to Christ, we don't literally die, but it should be as though we are dead. No longer living for what we used to live for. Putting aside the cares of the world, uh, the desires of the flesh, the allurements of Satan, putting all that aside and just dying to the Lord, and guess what? He'll come and take us by the hand. And he'll say, you know what? Be raised in newness of life. Um, that's our experience before the Lord. And then in verse 28, And he came into the house. His disciples began questioning him privately, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, This, can't, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. And uh, one of the other accounts tells us that he also said, because of the, because of the littleness of your faith, um, you could not cast him out. This kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. That's the Matthew, uh, Matthew 17. But anyways, here he says, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Notice the question that they have. Why could we not drive him out? Why couldn't we do this? Uh, it, it almost seems as though maybe the disciples, having been casting out demons and, and having this power that had been given to them by Christ, maybe they were beginning to have too much faith in themselves. Prayer would have been the way in which they would have said, no, we can't do this, God. We need you to do this. We need you to step in and, and do this. And that could be a problem for us as well. As the Lord's working through us and working in us and equipping us and empowering us to do His service, and at first we're relying on him because maybe we're just stepping into something. We're like, I don't know what I'm doing, Lord. I need your help. Please step in and help us. And then the Lord helps us and we become maybe successful in this ministry or whatever it is that we're doing. And time passes by pretty soon. We might begin to think, oh, I got this. <laughs> I'm the one doing this. Uh, it can happen to preachers. It can happen to, you know, whatever you're doing. You begin to think, oh, I, I got this handled. But then time comes in which we realize, okay, maybe I don't have the strength. This, uh, this kind of thing can only be accomplished through prayer. And we could add fasting, that is, uh, through committing ourselves to the Lord and, and submitting to Him and letting Him work through us, putting ourselves aside and saying, Lord, I need you to do it. Uh, maybe the disciples were getting a little bit off here, and Jesus is saying, no, you can't do this, only prayer can do this. Very similar to what Moses did. Remember uh, when they were in the wilderness of Zen, and that is when they were in the wilderness with the Israelites, and they're complaining about water again. God had already given them water out of, out of uh, a rock previously, 
Now they're grumbling again, and the Lord said, just speak to the rock, and, and water will come out. In other words, kind of a, a symbol of prayer. Just speak to the rock, and the water will come forth, the rock symbolizing Christ. But what did they do? You rebels, must, you know, must, must we give you this water? Uh, he's saying, you know, me and Aaron, we're the ones who will give you this water. Why, you know, why are you complaining? And he began to take credit, and that's, that's something that is oftentimes myths with Moses. Why did God keep him from going to the promised land? He was putting himself in the place of God. He was saying, I can give you that water. Why, why, you rebels, you come into us so that we can give you water. No, only God can give the water. All you need to do is speak. Very important. We don't forget to speak. Don't take it into our own hands. Pray over everything. Everything you do for the Lord, bring it under prayer. Consecrate it by prayer. Saturate it, sanctify it in prayer. Don't try to do it in your own power and your own strength. And then we'll just look at... Uh, few more verses and then we'll close verse 30 here he's going to talk about his death and resurrection it says from there they went out and began to go through galilee and he did not want anyone to know about it for he was teaching his disciples and telling them the son of man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and when he has been killed he will rise three days later but they did not understand this statement and they were afraid to ask him this is a very significant point in the book of Mark. It may not seem so if you're just reading it. Oh yeah, he's just saying what he said before. But here in verse 30 where it says he went out and began to go through Galilee, not in the way that he did before where he went through Galilee, he's going to different villages and preaching. Now he's up north and he's going through Galilee. Where is he going? Not to preach in the different, different uh, areas. He's going down to be crucified. And this is a turning point in the book of Mark. He's going to go, we'll see him um, probably next week when we pick up here in this chapter, go to Capernaum, which was south of Caesarea Philippi. And we're going to see him go into Judea. And then, uh, then we'll see him go into Jerusalem. If you also look at John, he goes to Bethany and then goes into Jerusalem. But he's making his way now to Jerusalem. The path is now set before Christ. He's, he's on his way to crucifixion. Uh, and he's preparing his disciples for that. And uh, he basically tells them, when I go, I'm going to die. In three days, I'll, I'll be raised again. And they still didn't understand this statement. And it says now they're afraid to ask him. So maybe because they had just gotten rebuked or who knows, for whatever reason, now they're afraid to even bring it up. So maybe they're ashamed that they don't understand. Who knows? But uh, that's what's going on. So those are the verses we'll, we'll stop at uh, this morning. Faith, 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 faith. we got to be walking by faith. Everything is about faith. We have access to the greatest power in the universe if we'll just have faith. If we'll just pray. If we'll stop trusting in ourselves. If we'll just understand that He can accomplish amazing things if we'll just believe. We need to have that type of faith. A, a child, demonic, out of his mind, out of control, uncontrollable, found new life through Christ. Again, we could go back to this theme of impossible situations. If we can find people in our lives today who might be experiencing the same thing, but if we bring them to Jesus Christ, there's a power beyond our understanding that can really change a person's life. Transformation power. And that's what we offer you this morning if you're here and you haven't come to Christ. Maybe you think, well, I'm too far gone for Christ. My life is too crazy, too chaotic. I've been involved in sin for too long. Don't believe that. Jesus Christ came for transformation. He came and he can change your life. Just as he's changed millions of other people's life. Come to him, let him do his transforming work, and see if you don't have a complete change of life uh, before him. So if you want to do that, we encourage you to do so. If you're online, if you want to be baptized, contact us in some way. We offer baptisms anytime. We'll stop what we're doing. We'll get here and we'll baptize you, whatever you want. Just contact us in some way. But for those here, if you would like to respond to the invitation, please do so as JT stands and sings the song.